Hello, I'm Edwin Newman. One of the most booming boom towns in the world is Jerusalem. Everywhere you look, something's going up. Under the pressure of immigration and economic expansion, this is true not only on the Israeli side, but in what used to be Jordanian Jerusalem. On both sides, the boom is evidence that Israel is settling in further, as what the Israelis expect, confidently expect to be a permanent part of the Middle East. It is not without significance that the larger part of the construction force working on the boom is Arab. That is true not only in the territories Israel has occupied since the Six-Day War in 1967, but in Israel itself. After a quarter of a century, there is no peace between Israel and the Arab states, but there is a ceasefire, fairly well observed, and there is here and there in the Arab world an inkling of greater acceptance of Israel's existence. Still, there is also, of course, on the part of many Arabs, a persistent and even implacable opposition to Israel. And the Israelis know that real peace may be a long way off and that there may be much trouble ahead. They would be foolish to think anything else. But this is a fairly stable and hopeful time for them. And anyone who has made periodic visits to Israel notices that at once. The world has long since got used to the idea that a woman is in charge of Israel's affairs, Prime Minister Golda Meir. The fact is, an Israeli and world scene without Mrs. Meir would take a lot more getting used to. Mrs. Meir has been Prime Minister since March 1969. Before that, she had a variety of government posts and party posts. She was, among other things, minister in Moscow and foreign minister. And it is Prime Minister Golda Meir who will be speaking freely today. Mrs. Meir, I wonder whether we might begin by speaking of Arab groups of the kind that hijack airplanes and killed Israeli athletes at Munich. They talk a great deal about the Palestinian homeland and how they've been deprived of it. Is there any legitimacy in talk about an Arab Palestinian homeland? No, I think not, at any rate. If uh, the homeland that is referred to is supposed to be Israel, I think it would be worthwhile just to take a minute, go back a little bit in history. For instance, between the, before the First World War, there were uh, no independent Arab countries. This area that is Israel today, and as a matter of fact, up to the Jordan, was considered uh, the southern part of Syria. When after the war, the uh, Great Britain got the uh, mandate over Palestine, Palestine was then between the entire area, between the Mediterranean and the Iraqi border. All of that was Palestine. There was one high commissioner and considered one, one country. The first partitioning of Palestine took place in 1922, when after the war, uh, Great Britain saw fit to parcel out this area of the Middle East and give part of uh, it to every one of the chefs who were helpful in the war. They had to do something also for Abdullah. So they partitioned Palestine, made the western part of, Pal of the Jordan River, Palestine. The eastern part was called Transjordan. The second time Palestine was partitioned was in 47, of course. Now, but until 22, all of that was one country, it was one Palestine. Of course, in, uh, in Transjordan, or what is Jordan today, there are Bedouins, there are others, but you will not find one single country in this area, an Arab country, that hasn't various groups of Arab people. So to call, to say that there is a Palestinian people as apart from those that are in Jordan, especially, is 
This is not true to, to fact, not true to history. Now, between 48 and 67, after the War of Liberation, the Western Bank was later annexed by Abdullah, they were there. I, the, they were the majority in Jordan. If they wanted to set up uh, a state, or to call that state uh, Palestine, of course, they didn't have to ask our permission, and uh, we would have had nothing to do with it. Therefore, when they say the Palestinian people want the right to their land, what, what it really means is to drive the Jews out of this area and take over in addition to the about 19 or 20 independent Arab countries, all that have been created between the First and Second World War, create one more country instead of Israel. This is uh, really what it's meant. Well, what, what then is the significance of the acts of terror that we see, the acts of pressure and propaganda of various kinds? Why then do these people behave as they do? They don't want us here. But uh, to my sorrow, it isn't only they that do not want us here. Who are they? They're the people who, because of the War of 48, fled this area into Jordan, into Syria, and other places, and have never been resettled. That is, they were refugees. And uh, certainly I admit, and one has to admit it, that as far as from the humanitarian point of view, here are groups of hundreds of thousands of people who have lived uh, in camps for uh, so many years under miserable conditions. Why haven't they been resettled? Jordan actually was not viable without these people. Jordan had a population of maybe about 300,000. Uh, why weren't they not resettled? Some of them were. But generally, why was there not a resettlement of refugees, of the Arab refugees? Because not only the refugees, but the Arab countries themselves felt that they should remain in their camp. They should not be resettled. It was one of the weapons against Israel. There were military uh, measures, there were uh, there's economic boycotts, and one of the methods was to keep the refugees in the camp, uh, feeding a hope that someday they'll march into the country and march us out. So um, they don't like us, they don't want us here. Our Arab neighbors to my sorrow, have not yet acquiesced to our existence, therefore wars. And uh, it's all one problem, really, that the Arabs in this area, in the immediate area, are not prepared to live in peace with us. Mr. Mayor, it appears from what you say that you accept that Palestinians, or whatever you want to call them, refugees, have been made victims, one way or another, that they have a legitimate grievance. Uh, what can be done to meet their grievance, then? They have become victims through the fact that after the United Nations in 47 decided on the partitioning of Palestine, mind you, west of the Jordan River, into a Jewish state and an Arab state. We accepted. And uh, the Arab countries did not. And there was war. Can't imagine that there ever was a war without refugees. The difference is, in this case, that uh, the Arab people who fled the area that became Israel afterwards were actually among their own people. For instance, uh, we Jews are a classic nation of refugees. But uh, when we were refugees, we were uh, a 
among strangers with the different people who have different religion, who spoke a different language, a different culture, entirely different. These people are among their own people. It's the same language, the same religion, the same way of life. The fact that a line was uh, drawn didn't make them any different. And, uh, but that they suffered, I accept. The question is, was that necessary? Because during that period, during these years, Israel has absorbed from the Arab countries a much larger number of Jews than the number of Arabs that left this area. Uh, nobody speaks of uh, Iraqi and Jewish refugees in, uh, in Israel or uh, Syrian Jewish refugees or Moroccan Jewish refugees. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, anybody that knows the situation will agree that uh, there was a greater clash between European Jews that came here or Israeli Jews who have been here for centuries, generations, and Jews that came from Yemen or Jews that came from, uh, let's say, the Atlas Hills in Morocco. The only thing that really um, made us one was religion. Because we're Jews, we're one of the same nation, but no common language and uh, sometimes uh, centuries apart in culture, and yet we absorb them, and uh, we're one people. Is there anything, Mrs. Prime Minister, that Israel can do to remove this center of infection, really, a source of infection for the whole Middle East, these Arab refugees, these unsatisfied, unhappy people, unsettled, really. Because going around, as I've been doing the last few days, one still sees refugee camps that go back to 1948. Okay. Is there anything that Israel can do? We have said immediately after the war, after the War of Liberation in 48, 49, that uh, we are prepared to pay compensation for anything that these the people have left behind, whether it's uh, land, whether it's orange groves, whether it's houses, anything. We have uh, allowed tens of thousands of them to come back because Families were separated during the fighting. And if part of the families remain here, and if they uh, no problem of security, we allow them to come back. Now, the United Nations had a committee to investigate what these people left behind. And we cooperated with them. It comes up uh, large sums of money. Now, if there had been peace, this money, uh, the aid from international aid and from various governments, there's no doubt this thing would have been forgotten. And they would have been resettled in agriculture or in industry or in any other way. Instead, the United Nations during these years poured hundreds of millions of dollars into miserable camps. We found the camps now, for instance, in the Gaza Strip. It's, uh, it's unheard of that people should be kept in, uh, in conditions of that kind. But it was done with this idea, the worse the better. These people must be miserable. They must live in conditions of that kind. They must not resettle and have a home of their own or so on, uh, so that uh, they will be an instrument against Israel. What about the terrorism, Mrs. Mayor? Israel takes a very firm line against terrorists, against hijackers, uh, whereas other countries do not. What is the, uh, even when the lives of others are involved, you say, don't give in to hijackers. What is your reasoning there, since innocent lives are at stake? Innocent lives are always at stake. The question is, can 
innocent Israeli lives become a commodity that groups of men and women can just do with them whatever they like. Because uh, when they take a plane, for instance, let us take the, uh, the last uh, incident, the one of Lufthansa in, uh, in Germany. Uh, nobody would say that it's a simple matter. Of course not. But look what happens. These men demand the release from prison of men who participated in the killing of our people in the uh, Olympic uh, village. They say and practice, but they say openly, we want them out. As soon as they land in Libya, they make a statement, now they'll start all over again. So of course lives are involved. But it means that uh, people are uh, set free when everybody knows that what they intend to do, the first opportunity, they will kill more Israelis. It's a difficult problem, I don't say it's easy. But uh, Israel cannot say, well, as long as it involves Israelis, uh, it's all right. Mr. Mayor, it is sometimes suggested that the terrorist organizations act out of a fear of a solution being arrived at between Israel and the Arab states. Is there a prospect of such a solution? A solution between us and the Arab states? Yes. I'm sure there is. The question is, when? Look, one must not, I think, look at the situation in the Middle East as though there are Arab countries that uh, involve themselves in war with Israel, but uh, it doesn't hurt them. It doesn't hurt their people, their governments carry an immense uh, war budget, uh, but uh, their countries develop and they have uh, modern schooling and health services and so on. But for little Israel, it suffers. It's too bad about Israel. But it really doesn't matter. It doesn't affect so much the Arab countries. Of course, that's a distorted picture. Because as long as our Arab neighbors are at war with us, certainly they suffer at least as much as we do. As a matter of fact, we have managed with great difficulty to defend ourselves and at the same time uh, to, uh, to build a country which is more or less uh, decent, uh, more or less modern. It's not all that we wanted to happen or that could have happened if we didn't have to defend ourselves. But still, uh, we were 650,000 when the state was established. There are 800,000 children in school uh, today and we have uh, compulsory free education from five and now from four to 15. There's not one single village in the country, no matter where it is, that is out of reach of a hospital or that there isn't a doctor in the area. And there's industry, there's modern agriculture, there is, uh, there is culture, there's music, there's theater. There's I mean, I say it isn't all that we want. We could have done much more when in a country like this we have a community of close to 50,000 young men and young women in institutions of higher learning. All this without uh, practically one single uh, month, I could say almost, without one single day of peace. Now, this isn't exactly what happened on the other side. So. War in this area is something that is uh, hurtful to Israel and to the others. Peace, if it comes and when it comes, is uh, a very important uh, situation for Israel. We're not ashamed to say that we want peace, but also for the other countries. So anybody that is interested in this area must not fall into uh, a way of thinking, well, 
There ought to be peace because Israel needs peace. The entire area needs peace. And the tens of millions of people in our neighboring Arab uh, states, they are the main sufferers. Are you suggesting then that it is because they are suffering and it is because these countries are less well off than Israel is in the particulars you've cited that there is some hope of peace, that that will create the pressure for peace in Arab countries? Yes, I don't think that uh, our Arab neighbors will present us with uh, a presence of peace. The real tragedy is that the leaders of these tens of millions of people in the various Arab countries do not realize how essential it is for their people. If they did, I think we would have had peace many years ago. Mr. Mayor, can you offer any opinion, any theory about the intentions of King Hussein of Jordan at this point? Well, I think the uh, positive developments in uh, this area, as far as our neighbors are concerned, that King Hussein has come to the conclusion, evidently because he said so, that there must be a solution of peace between uh, Jordan and Israel, and I think he accepts that for all the uh, neighboring countries. And uh, he once said, I believe that another war is another catastrophe, maybe a greater catastrophe for the Arab people. I don't think he has come to this conclusion uh, for Israel's sake, but he realizes what, is, uh, what it has done to him and to his people, and knows what is happening in Arab countries better than I do. He knows that from, from his close contact with them. Well, that's a very positive development. The next thing that uh, King Hussein, I think, has to do is to realize that uh, since the war was brought on Israel by his participation, as well as Egypt and Syria and so on, he cannot expect and must not expect that everything goes back exactly where it was before he entered the war and attacked uh, Jerusalem again, as his grandfather did in 48, and attacked other parts of the country. When he comes to that conclusion, then we're really on the way to peace. How far, ca how, how close can he get to the situation as, as it existed before 1967? Well, that's... Uh, can only be done in negotiations. Uh, you know, it's a well-known fact that Israel has not drawn maps, and we don't play games with ourselves. It isn't that uh, we don't have ideas. We have. But uh, the basic idea is, all other ideas are based on one idea that we want peace with our neighbors. And what we want to gain in peace as far as territory is concerned, is not uh, territorial annexation. What we want is uh, change in territory to the extent that it is essential for us uh, to have borders that uh, promise uh, greater security than what we had before. Well, one gathers, Mrs. Prime Minister, that with Jordan it would not be a great problem but that you would, for example, insist on holding the Golan Heights taken from Syria, and that that might be a much more ticklish problem than the, uh, than the Jordan problem. I don't want to... Uh, Negotiate on a television program. No, no, I don't <laughs> want to say uh, to King Hussein that with Jordan there is no problem, because I don't think it, I, I would be uh, honest if I said so. There are problems. I have to see uh, his side of it, too. There is Jerusalem. Uh, not that uh, Jordan had any claim in Jerusalem. It was never decided that Jerusalem, or part of it, uh, should be Jordanian. And what happened in 48 was uh, by this uh, breaking of this terrible principle of the inadmissibility of conquest by force, we were weak in 48. Jordan was much stronger. The Arab Legion was uh, a good army at that time, led by British, trained by British. 
and uh, they took part of Jerusalem. Uh, so I don't think he'll, he ought to get it back. I, I'm sure he won't, but he wants it back. So that, at any rate, from his point of view, it's a problem. Uh, then again, uh, the Western Bank, you can't expect us to restore the boundaries where they were before so that we again have about uh, 12 miles between the sea and the former border. There are problems. They're not problems that cannot be solved. I think uh, all problems between us and our neighbors can be solved. Why should the Golan Heights be such a serious problem from Syria unless they, ex they again want to be in a position where they can shell our villages in the valleys? If they had, they had no intention of that kind, and if they hadn't done what they did for so many years, there would have been no problem. Now they want us to come down again, come down from the hill to the valley so that they can put up their guns up above. That, that's a problem. Mr. Mayer, one often hears that Arab leaders would find it very difficult to make peace with Israel, that they could not themselves survive politically, maybe survive at all, if they did make peace. Uh, that's thought to be particularly the case in Egypt, for example, and, uh, well, to name another one, Iraq. Could a man like President Sadat of Egypt survive if he made peace with Israel, do you think? Is that something you have to think about? Um, I think we all have to think about it. The question is, is that our primary responsibility for Israel? What happens in these countries? <coughs> of course, one of the sources of the uh, tragedy is the regimes. They're not democratic regimes, they're dictatorships. Uh, each dictator, in order to keep himself above water, promises his people various things. One of the things that every dictator in this country promised, in this area, promised their people that Israel will be destroyed. Uh, one thing I think they can't be blamed for is that they didn't try. That they did and couldn't, did not succeed. <coughs> uh, maybe it's too much to expect from a dictator that he goes back to his people, has the courage to tell them, well, I've tried, you know I've tried, but we can't do it. And since you people are paying the price for it because of uh, illiteracy and because of poverty and because of uh, hunger and so on, we have to give it up. Live at peace with Israel and build ourselves. Now, uh, if you go on promising people that next month it's going to happen, I uh, objectively understand that it's difficult for him to do it. And maybe he's risking uh, his being in power, maybe even his life. But I'm sorry, I don't know how we can help him. Mr. Mayor, the Russians withdrew from Egypt at the demand of Egypt. And did, that, did that fact make a settlement or make the prospect of peace, did it improve the prospect of peace in the Middle East? Very many people thought so. We hoped so. But actually, if you analyze the situation, we have never said that the Russians are driving Egypt to war against us. I think for two reasons, to be fair to the Russians. I don't think it's a major point in their policy to destroy Israel. What they wanted to do is to buy themselves, or to buy their entrance into the Middle East on the basis of feeding uh, Nasser or any other Arab leader what he wants most. And in 1955, they found that what Nasser wants most is not tractors, and not modern industrial plants and schools and so on. What he wants most is the tanks and planes in order to destroy Israel. But they were prepared to give it to them. 
to give it to him and kept on giving it to him all the time. Now, when they left, we thought, well, if Sadat became disappointed with the Russians, on what grounds? That Russia was not giving him enough material with which to destroy us. Maybe he'll make up his mind that, all right, he's lost this French too. He doesn't believe the Americans will help him destroy Israel. Maybe then he should turn around and make peace with us. But that hasn't happened. You see, in all this, there's one more point that has to be taken into consideration. It's not only because we, we're, we're committed to democracy and can't envisage a different uh, regime. But look, whether it's Israel, whether it's the United States, any other democratic country, a government uh, takes a decision which it is convinced of is good for the people. Not always popular. It goes to its parliament, presents its, uh, or whether the president says, doesn't make any difference, but there's a body democratically elected that has to deal with it. But let us take our form of government, British form of government. Suppose a government decides something, and uh, we go to, to the parliament, what can happen? We lose the majority in parliament. So what? So there are new elections. When there are new elections, either we are re-elected, or another party gets into government. The state remains. If we lose, we'll think uh, too bad. The others can't do as well as we do. The other party will think they'll do better. But nobody is killed. Uh, there is no uh, taking over by force. Nothing happens. Saddam, or Nasser before him, or Assad in, uh, in Syria, or the other one in Iraq, they're all, they always have to take into account that if they make a decision which is not popular, which is against the uh, education that they gave their people, He'll lose his post. He'll, he'll, he'll not be president again. How will he not be president? He will not be re-elected? 